Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Cordell and Cordell webinar on divorce and specifically the 10 stupidest mistakes men make when facing divorce and some tips on how to avoid them and hopefully prepare for them. Uh, so we're going to be moving very quickly today. So get some pen and paper out and you can take some notes, but really uh, the majority, if not everything uh, contained in today's seminars, we rapidly move through it is really contained in this book here, which is the 10 stupidest mistakes. And it's on sale at Amazon. A lot of detail in here that we're not going to cover uh, because we just don't have the time to do it. So we're going to run through very, very quickly through those mistakes and we'll address some of them and some of the, you know, the more important key points in each mistake. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Cordell and Cordell quickly. Uh, we are a domestic relations firm. If you haven't uh, heard of us or know anything about us, we're across the country. Specifically, we have offices throughout Tennessee and in Chattanooga. Um, we do domestic relations only. And uh, we do everything before, during, and after divorce, which is you know, premarital, premarital agreements, prenuptial agreements, divorce, modifications, paternity, anything related to family law we handle. And as I said, we have offices around the country, including the UK, with about 280 lawyers across the country. So that's really all I wanted to tell you quickly. You can uh, find us at CordellCordell.com or even more information at DadsDivorce.com or Men'sDivorce.com. Uh, we have a live seminar coming up in Chattanooga on October the 23rd at the Chattanooga Marriott downtown. And we'd encourage you to go online and register at mensdivorceschool.com. Uh, there, you're going to get some of this information as well, but you get more detailed information about the divorce process, uh, some strategy tips, but best of all, something you won't get today, and that is an opportunity to speak with the Cordell and Cordell divorce attorneys. Ask them questions. You'll get the answers. Today, it's just about learning, getting some information quickly, giving you the tools and uh, things to go find out some more information online. And you can always do that at dadsdivorce.com. So let's get started. Uh, we'll go right through it and get to some of the mistakes that guys make uh, when facing divorce. And really does happen to be some of the more, uh, the most important question that guys ask uh, when they're facing divorce and when they come in for a consult is really, do I move out? And it, it tends to be, the very first question that guys ask. And do I move out? Should I move out? Uh, I have moved out. What do I do now? Uh, all of those things have ramifications. So one of the things I tell clients continuously throughout in consults and when I do represent them is that every decision that you make in divorce has a consequence, good, bad, and neutral. And so let's talk about moving out. And there are times when you should, but generally my answer is no. Uh, and let me back up quickly before we get through a lot of these mistakes, making sure that you understand that I don't want to give you legal advice. And I'm not going to do that today. Uh, I am licensed in Missouri, Illinois, and Georgia. Uh, and so I want to make sure that what you get from today are strategies without legal uh, advice, because I can't do that. I don't know enough about your case. What I want this intended to be is educational. And I also want this to be, to serve as an opportunity for you to, uh, spur a conversation with your attorney. And if you don't have one, we'll talk a little bit about how to find one. So let's get back to moving out. So whether you have kids or not, what's really important uh, is to make that right decision. And if you've made the decision already to move out or stay, uh, it can change. But what it does require is that you have a conversation uh, with your attorney to make sure that it is a good one. So let's talk about where, whether you have kids. Uh, let's say you have no kids and you come to me and say, should I move out? Generally, I'm going to say no. But guys often do. I mean, they may be in the midst of uh, domestic violence. Uh, they may have issues where they just can't stay. They can't emotionally or physically stay in the home. So I say, look, you have to understand when you do move out and you have no kids, you're going to be facing double household expenses. It's one of the biggest mistakes guys make because they don't anticipate that. Uh, your wife's attorney is going to tell her, look, don't pay the bills. Don't pay the mortgage. Don't pay the utilities. Uh, don't pay anything. Not automobile. Uh, not nothing, telephone, nothing. Take all the money out of the checking account, make him pay it. So now you've moved out of your home. You didn't bring anything with you. You move into a one bedroom apartment that has no furniture, uh, and you can't even, uh, sleep, but you'll be sleeping on the floor, but now she's paying nothing and you're paying the mortgage because ultimately it's your largest asset. And we'll be telling you it's a decision you're going to have to make. Do you save your largest asset, which is your home, oftentimes has the largest amount of equity and oftentimes bigger than what you have in retirement? And the answer is yes, you should save it. But until you can get to court to try to apportion 
the responsibility for those debts, those recurring monthly expenses, most guys will be faced with double household expenses through the duration of the case until they can get a judge to apportion them. And that's huge because most guys can't afford one house living together with their wife, much less for two, a small bedroom apartment while she lives in your home with her boyfriend and you're paying for it. It doesn't sit well. Also, uh, loss of household goods when you move out, whether you have kids or not, you're not always able to bring everything that you own with you, particularly the things that you brought into the marriage, that separate property that you so desperately want, and it somehow disappears. You move out, uh, you come back for it, and she'll tell you, oh, you took it, and you know you didn't, or you'll find it on eBay, or you'll be set on fire and left outside in the rain. Uh, I've seen it happen. And she gets into the courtroom and she'll tell the judge, well, I, he took it with him and she'll cry and she'll prevail. So if you move out, take everything you want with you. And lastly, when it comes to personal goods is video or photograph everything in the house. And that is take a personal inventory, give it to your attorney, because if you left it behind, plan on never getting it. But if you did leave it behind, let's plan on making sure your attorney knows to ask for it quickly and put it on our personal inventory list. I mean, there's just so many ramifications when you do move out. Many guys think that they have to move out and they just don't. They can stay in the house through the duration. I mean, I've had couples, one lived on the top floor, one lived in the basement. They put tape on the floor and they didn't cross. They put uh, alarm systems between floors so that they wouldn't go in it with motion detectors. While it sounds ridiculous, it worked because they couldn't afford two homes. And they stayed and it did. And actually they stayed living together for about 90 days after the divorce uh, while they were trying to put the home up for sale. So now it changes a little bit when you have kids. And most guys say, well, look, am I abandoning my kids? Am I leaving them behind? Well, there's, a, there's some legal significance when you use the word abandon. And this is not one of those. It's not the legal definition of abandonment when you don't support or no contact. What this really is, it's a loss of access, a loss of control. Uh, easiest said by saying, you're no longer driving the bus. You're just a passenger and it's out of control. <coughs> Excuse me. And so imagine this, you move out, uh, you want to see your kids as frequently as you can. You get into an argument and your wife is going to show um, no sensitivity, no empathy. She's going to say, you know, I know it was your weekend, but we're busy. Slams the door in your face and you can't do anything about it. Because if you do and you try to get in, she'll call the police. Now you have an order of protection. You've got problems. So what happens is guys think that everything's going to stay the same, that actually it, it calms it. It does calm the situation, but it creates a status quo where you're seeing them one night a week, maybe every other weekend. And those every other weekends aren't overnights. So you're not getting the schedule that you want. And so when you stroll into court, imagine the testimony where the judge hears, well, how are the kids doing? Oh, they're doing great. And their grades, uh, they're getting A's. Uh, any behavioral issues? None. The teachers come in and say the same thing but you're, you're getting one night a week, every other weekend, no overnights. What judge is going to change the status quo when your kids are doing better than they were when you were living together, better than when you had more time? Not one judge. They're not risk takers. And so that's the problem of moving out. Oftentimes you want to stay in. And the worst thing you'll find is parental alienation. I ask guys across the country when I'm in these seminars live, and we'll do that again in a couple of weeks here in Chattanooga, in a show of hands, who's heard of parental alienation? I'd Google it now while you're listening and watching because it happens in every case. And most guys, I would tell you that maybe one, max two hands go up in any seminar when there's 100 guys in the room and they don't know it. So it's best described as this, as by example. You move out and mom immediately goes to your child and says, look, I know your dad doesn't love us anymore uh, and that's why he's moved out. He's got a new life. He's going to start a new family with a new girlfriend and a new mom, and he'll have new kids, and they're replacing us, but I will always be there for you. And it's a birthday of the child, and I know, you know, I love you, and I get you a birthday present, but your dad doesn't send us any money because he has a new family to support. But again, I'm going to work two or three jobs to take care of us, and I'll always protect you. Imagine what that does to a child. Uh, it destroys a relationship between dad and the child, and that is parental alienation. And there are experts throughout the country who are testifying to that, using that information uh, to gain custody away or getting more custody. Plenty of courts are starting to recognize parental alienation. I would encourage you to look it up. So 
in the end and a very quick move out. Most of the time, do not move out. So let's go on to the next one, which is choosing the wrong lawyer. And that really is um, probably one of the more important uh, decisions you should make, obviously, um, before you choose to move out. Uh, in fact, it's interesting. I'm actually going through the process of choosing a doctor. I'm trying to find a general practitioner or an internist right now. And so I always relate uh, the choice of a lawyer similar to choosing a doctor. Uh, it's an intimate personal relationship that you have to have a couple things. And that is trust, uh, experience, uh, uh, superior knowledge, and doing the thing that you're looking for most. And that is family law. I always stress that if you have cancer, you're not going to go to uh, a, a cardiologist. You're not going to go to a general practitioner. You're going to an oncologist because you want to go to the one person who's done the most research, has the most experience to try to tackle the problem that you're facing. And that's why I always encourage clients that come in the door. In fact, yesterday I was meeting with a gentleman and I said, I want you to go in, interview two or three more lawyers. One, I'm confident you'll come back to me. But I also want you to get an understanding of what it is, that relationship, because we're going to talk a little bit about that relationship between uh, lawyers and their clients as it relates to the differences between doctors and their patients. And there is a distinct difference. But choosing your lawyer is such a critical point because there's some things you also want to ask that lawyer. Uh, you want to know their litigation experience. You want to know their feelings towards trial. There are a lot of lawyers who like to mediate. And that's all they want to do. And they want to settle your case. Now, I'm not opposed to settlement. And we are at Cordell and Cordell. We do it all the time. But we truly believe that the way to set up and to settle your case is to be prepared for trial first and foremost. Because the other side has nothing to lose. They don't fear anything. If you just come in and start talking settlement, it's like any negotiation in business. Uh, they're not going to accept a contract. They're not going to accept an offer unless they think that they're, they're going to lose the deal. And so that is preparing for trial knowing what you can do, uh, and finding a lawyer who's willing to do it. Finding lawyers who have received prestigious awards, super lawyers, uh, or the like. You want to ask those questions. You want to ask them if they have processes in place. That's one of the things at Cordell & Cordell that we find that is, is critical, is that is processes to keep the clients informed, not only on a daily, weekly basis, or monthly basis, but 24-7. We have a client portal that you can log on and see the what's going on in your file 24 seven on your time, not our time. But when you don't log in, we're giving you updates. You want your lawyer to return your phone calls the same business day. And I say that and I laugh every time I talk about it in these seminars because it is ridiculous. Our own corporate lawyers who handle our business uh, dealings won't even return our calls the same day. It's frustrating. And, and so you should demand it. Will you return my call the same business day? Will you return my email the same business day? And if they hesitate, then that is not the lawyer for you. Because the one thing that is clear is that your case doesn't end at 5 p.m. You live it 24-7. You may not be engaged with your uh, spouse arguing, but the stress of divorce, the stress of uncertainty lives 24-7. You want your attorney to give a cell number. You want your attorney to have access, to be accessible, not only during the day, at night, on the weekends. It's our job. <clears throat> it doesn't end at, at five o'clock for us. We're returning calls on the weekends. We're handling calls on holidays because that's when family law really matters most is those times when the client needs you. So those things are really important. But lastly, I think is preparation. You want an attorney whose focus in your case is preparation. I can tell you far too many times and far too many lawyers across the country in family law and I think they're plagued with this, and that is they don't they wing it. They don't prepare. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about financial statements and preparing and uh, going through, preparing for testimony, preparing for war, because in reality, that's what it is. Imagine going into war and winging it, going into a battle and not being prepared, not knowing what the other side's going to do. No one would ever do that with an expectation of prevailing. But choosing your lawyer has to be those things. And it has to be someone, first and foremost, that does family law only. Uh, I'm a big believer in that. That's why we 
uh, began our practice in the 90s and started focusing entirely on representing men facing divorce and, and really having our attorneys across the country and the United Kingdom to really do their education in just family law. So that's about choosing the right or the wrong lawyer. <clears throat> Usually, um, this mistake I tried to save for the end, but I thought it was important that we talk about it now, and that is waiting for your wife to file or filing first. I, I met with a guy yesterday, and that question was um, the very question he had. And that is, when is the right time? <clears throat> do I do it now? Are there advantages legally, strategically? What do I do? And particularly in, in family law, there are opportunities. And uh, I spent about 20 minutes yesterday talking to the client and said, look, you're not going to hear this from a divorce lawyer, but I'm going to ask you, is your marriage over? Do you think it can be saved? Uh, is it irretrievably broken? Is there any chance at reconciliation? And I know he was looking at me oddly because you normally don't hear that from a divorce lawyer. You're just, you know, thrust a fee agreement and let's go. But I always said a, a bad marriage is better than a terrible divorce. And so we want to ensure that before you consider filing first, <clears throat> that you consider whether your marriage can be saved. Because that's as equally important to us. And that's always been our position at Cordell and Cordell. But when you've reached that point where many guys like yesterday, this gentleman, he was convinced that, that it wasn't going to happen. They weren't going to reconcile. They had just grown apart. There were no bad acts, nothing to consider. But I said, what are you waiting for? And he thought, well, maybe she should file. Sometimes it's a feeling of guilt. Sometimes they want the other party to make that decision. But there are many considerations when it comes to family law. Some of them are strategic. Sometimes our clients, you, you have some things that went on during the marriage that you're not proud of. Not only you're not proud, you're embarrassed. But the point is, those are the opportunities when you want to present your evidence first. Keep in mind, when you file first, if you don't settle your case, you get to present your evidence first. Uh, that is the longest time you'll ever spend listening and cringing and wishing you had filed first if you didn't. When you're at trial and your wife's on the stand beating you up, saying things you know not to be true, uh, acts that never happened, words you never said, things you never did. But now we have a judge whose attention span is somewhere between 40 minutes and 60 minutes, writing everything down feverishly about you. Negative. Your chance to sell the judge, which is really your jury. That's why in juries you do opening statements. You want to sell the jury right off the bat about your strategy, what your case is going to be about, why the jury should like you. The judge is your jury. I mean, there are two states in which you can do jury trials, Texas and Georgia, but typically not. So you have an opportunity to impress your judge immediately and representing guys is about appearance and presentation and you pretty much get one chance. And if that one chance hasn't happened right away, it could be devastating for your case. I can tell you that I was uh, second. My client was insistent on not filing and 20 years ago, I remember this very vividly. They're beating him up uh, with their, their evidence and their testimony and uh, I could see the judge focus on his computer and he was typing like crazy, like smoke was coming from his fingers. So I got up and just was walking around acting like I was just trying to stretch during the uh, petitioner's testimony. And I looked over and there's the judge writing the judgment already. We're probably an hour in. My client looks like he's a terrible person, which he's not. Uh, everything on the stand could be controverted with cross-examination and testimony from my client. But the judge had already made his decision. Totally wrong but that's life in the family court system. So sometimes consideration is what bad acts do we have? What did you do? And I always ask the client, what is the worst thing your wife is going to say about you? The one worst thing. And I, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but the point is, don't be afraid to share that. Uh, I've heard it all. There isn't anything I'll be shocked about, which sounds ludicrous, but doing this 25 years, you've heard it all. Uh, income considerations. Is your income high? Is it low? Are you making overtime? Are you getting stock options, bonuses? I've met with gentlemen, especially in the 2008, 2009, uh, and prior to that, where their income was at its lowest. And I did an interview, and one time I was asked, well, can your guys afford to file? And I said, well, they can't afford not to file. And that's an interesting statement, but the point is, is at your lowest point, 
you want to get a judgment set, especially in income. And courts at that time, and I think nowadays, are a little bit more open to understanding the big swings of income and understanding that uh, guys, normal guys, middle income guys, hardworking guys, blue collar guys, their income goes up and down. And that's who Cordell and Cordell represents. And the point is that needs to be a consideration whether you should file now. Illnesses. Uh, I met with a, a guy whose wife had a serious illness that was debilitating, that actually shortened her lifespan. The question becomes, why not do it now? Why wait till she gets worse? We need to get to a judgment, get to an order. We knew we were going to be paying spousal support or alimony or called maintenance. And so those occasions, we know that the factual situation requires us to get moving. There's nothing to be gained. In fact, one of the issues you want to consider is retirement. Meaning, what are you putting away in your 401k? How much is going in your pension plan? You're, you're contributing to your pension. 50 cents of every dollar is going to her the longer you wait. Why would you just continue to fund her retirement or her property settlement? Uh, it, you didn't think about some of those things. We always advise clients to consider stopping their contributions if they're going to wait. There's no point in setting her up for the future. Use that money to pay down debt or pay down something that you have. And so income and expenses uh, are a big factor. If she's spending a lot on credit cards, if she's going crazy, it sometimes can be a Band-Aid. You can stop the bleeding by filing and seeking a temporary order. Uh, many courts, many counties and states have local rules that go into effect, temporary orders upon filing that prevent excessive spending. So you want to talk about that. And then lastly, custody. If you're not getting the custody that you want, perhaps in mistake number one, you moved out, let's file. The longer the status quo goes, the worse it becomes for you. Now, if you're getting the, the best custody, you're getting week on week off, then Let's wait it out. Let's get a good period so long as she continues to provide you with the custody that you want. Then we can show an established status quo. And when you do file and she cuts you off, which she will cut you off, now we can show is retaliatory. Now we can poison that well and turn the judge against her. So when you do meet with your attorney, talk about filing first. Many states, I'm sure, do not have strategic uh, advantages. In, gosh, in the early 90s, there was an advantage in Missouri where whoever filed first and had physical custody of the child was the custodial parent pending the case. It was crazy. We would be racing to court. Uh, I just don't hear that anymore, and so it becomes a strategic one about your particular facts. Concealing information from your lawyer. And so many times when I do this seminar across the country, uh, I will give them themes. And so write this down. Uh, we'll have a couple of these today. Uh, doctor versus lawyer. It's easy to remember this one because it's an unusual title, unusual mistake. And what I mean is, um, imagine this. There, as I said earlier, there is a relationship difference between doctors and patients and lawyers and clients, and there should not be. I have two friends who are doctors, and we had this conversation, and this is how we came up, you know, I came up with this mistake. And I asked him, I said, look, do your clients ever tell you a lie? Intentionally or negligently, do they leave out facts? And he laughed and he said, never. In fact, he gets more information about their patients that are completely irrelevant than he wants. And he gets more information about their personal lives than he wants. Both of them were unanimous in saying that. And I said, look, that's just kind of the opposite of what we do in family law or even as a lawyer. You typically get clients, and, and you can blame a number of things. It can be because it's embarrassing. It can be because they think the little things don't matter, but they don't give all the information. And so I best describe it like this. So if you're injured and your left leg hurts, you pick up the phone, you call your doctor, and you need to make an appointment. Typically, the triage nurse is saying, well, what brings you in? Oh, uh, my left leg hurts. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow. You go into the nurse or you go into the doctor's office, you see the nurse, and the nurse again asks you, uh, why are you here? Uh, and you say, well, I know when I called, I said it's my left leg, but it's really not my left, it's my right. But you're lying to them. Not a single individual would say that ever because they don't want the doctor to look at their right leg because it doesn't hurt. And the reason they don't give false information is because they want to be healed. So the point being is, why wouldn't clients also want to be, uh, we'll call it healed, or they want to win, or they want to be 
uh, accomplish the tasks and the goals or get them closer to what they, they are setting out for themselves. Again, it's, uh, it's the nature of family law. Now, while doctors don't or can't use all the small information, uh, lawyers will. I tell my clients, keep a diary, write everything down, tell me everything. The littlest of things can matter and I can use the small facts, perhaps in your case. And that is so critically important. And, and the way that I look at this is an example. So I call it the one chip theory. If you're old enough to remember the Lay's potato chip commercials in the 70s, you can't just have one potato chip because they were so good. That's the way lies work or deceit or uh, leaving facts out. And you, you can tend to continue to do more and more. So I had a client come in to the office and he was just doing a consult and asked about separate property. He had inherited uh, an apartment complex, a large one, uh, from his father and wanted to ensure that he would get that property as his sole and separate property. He had done everything right. He had kept it in his name. Uh, it was in a trust. All the income was staying in a trust. He didn't use it. Uh, it had its own tax ID number, on and on and on. I mean, everything was perfect. And I said, look, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, he didn't believe me uh, and didn't retain at that time. So he left, or he didn't, well, let me back up. He asked how he could hide his assets. And I said, look, I, there's no way to do it. And in fact, I don't know why you would consider doing it because I can get you that property. So that's an important fact. Uh, every guy tends to ask and finds out from other friends how they can hide things, hide money, hide property, but it never works. And so he came back months later and retained, and I didn't connect the dots. I didn't written that down. We're in the middle of his case. We're at a deposition. And then at the deposition, at the conclusion, we start talking settlement and we settle the case on very favorable terms. And as I were walking out, the opposing counsel looks at me and says, oh, by the way, would you mind giving me an accounting of his checking account for the last six months? Money in, money out. I didn't hesitate. I said, absolutely. And the reason I didn't hesitate is because he made mistake number one, and that is he moved out and he had double household expenses and he'd been paying so much in and out. We were paying temporary alimony on top of that maintenance. And so I figured, no problem. He was the, the breadwinner. This shouldn't be an issue. There were no um, allegations of impropriety financially or otherwise. And so we're walking out and I tell the client, I said, look, all I need is an accounting. And I'm walking and I do this in the actual live seminar and I'll, I'll talk about this more in detail. <clears throat> but uh, he falls behind as I'm talking and I didn't realize he was already stopped in his tracks. I turn around and he's gone. He's there. I realize there's a problem. I said, what's going on? And he looks like he's about ready to get sick because he's so shocked. And I connect the dots. This is the guy. This is the one that said he wanted to hide assets. This is the one that wanted to get this property. And I asked him what's going on. So basically he was taking $25,000 a month of revenue from this very big apartment complex, taking it from the trust into the marital checking account, taking it out of the marital checking account, writing a check to his brother who would then kept the money for the last six, eight months and until the case was over so that he could cash out and get a quarter of a million dollars. So the, the other lawyer knew it. The other lawyer set us up because good lawyers find bad people. It's not that difficult. All she did was subpoena the bank statements and knew that there was money unaccounted for, where it was coming. She pretty much knew. She didn't have an absolute idea, but she knew that he was hiding money because it was the same amount every month in a check to the same individual, which was his brother. So what happened here is that good lawyers find bad people and judges are derailed by emotion. He lost his chance. That lie that he thought he knew better because his friends told him he could do it and it would make sense. Uh, if I said to him, I could have easily gotten you that property as separate, easily. So we go to trial and uh, he lost his chance to settle. He lost his chance to be victorious because we lost in every aspect. Uh, and I go on in, in the live seminar on October 23rd, you'll hear more about the testimony, but it was terrible. Uh, I call it the dreaded yes mode. And I won't go any further because I'd like to see you on October 23rd and tell you a little bit more about that. But to end this mistake and the way to avoid it, it is don't conceal information. Because typically speaking, and the facts that I get with guys, we always find a way to position them, to give them a great chance to succeed and accomplish the goal doesn't mean we do it every time, but absent outright child abuse, there hasn't been facts in which we couldn't formulate a good strategy, and your lawyer probably could too, 
to give you a good chance at success. And there are moments in which we say, look, this one has been commingled. There's no chance at it, but we can do X, Y, and Z on something else. He didn't trust his lawyer. He didn't treat his lawyer like a doctor. You wouldn't hide something so you could get healed. And so when you're choosing your lawyer, we talked about that in a mistake, make sure it's someone you can trust with all the information. Because if he had just taken my advice, the result would have been drastically different. <clears throat> mistake number five, neglecting the children. Uh, and you know, it's a hard word to say neglect because you, you know, automatically gives you uh, undertones of abuse, failure to provide support. What I'm talking about here is um, not being an involved dad. And especially when it comes to dads in custody, neglecting their needs, neglecting time, failing to look at the important things during your divorce or prior to. Because ultimately and perfectly, we'd like you to start doing this before you file. And so let's talk about it. Basically what this is, I want you, if you're seeking maximum time, there's a couple things you want to do. And they're really quick, easy bullet points. And that is stay involved. Don't fail to stay involved. Uh, go to parent-teacher conferences every time. Email the teachers. Uh, call the teachers. Be involved in school activities. Go to the small things. Making sure that uh, you email the teacher and say, look, keep me up to date on progress. If there are concerns, let me know. And even if it's a small one, get involved. Doctors, dentist. Did you know that doctors write down who presents the child in their notes, their permanent notes in the file? When you walk in, it'll say, father presents with child, mother presents with child, um, father not here. It's interesting. Most doctors will do that. Dentists will do the same. Go to every appointment, even if it's just a standard checkup. Or if it's an urgent care, you got to do it. I know that you're busy, but if you want maximum time, you want to take one thing away from mom, which is probably her best evidence, and that is you're uninvolved, uncaring, unknowing, do all those things. Clothes, shopping, buy them. Buy a second set. Know their sizes. Medium, large, whatever it is, kid size, adult small. Know their shoe size. I know that sounds simple. <coughs> Excuse me, I know it sounds odd, but if you get on the stand and the first question is, what size shirt does your son wear? And you hesitate, forget it. Or if you give a wrong size, forget it. That goes along with attend play dates. Sounds odd as a guy, but go to neighborhood play dates with other parents and other kids. Know the parents' names around. Know the kids' names that your kids are friends with. Um, also schedule things with them. Uh, stay home uh, on sick days. I know that's hard taking time off, but when your child is sick and it's your custody, don't call mom and say, Hey, can you take care of him? That evidence 100% is coming in at trial and it hurts. It hurts terribly. Homework, do the homework with your child. Set that time aside. Even if it's just to review saying, Hey, let's talk about what's your favorite class. Let's go through what's going on. Do you have a test? Do you have a quiz? Uh, stay involved, go online, see the reports, see their grades, talk to your child because you want that to be the, what's going on the status quo moving forward. And then most of all, when you talk about neglecting or failing to stay involved, do the fun stuff. It shouldn't always be the, the, you know, the medical, uh, the social times that your kids have and just sitting in the car, do the fun stuff, schedule fun stuff on your weeks, your weekends, your time. It shouldn't be you in front of the TV watching Monday night football or Saturday college football, or the World Series while your child is somewhere else because that testimony is coming in. They're going to ask the child, so what does your dad do when you're there? Oh, he's always in front of the TV watching football. That hurts. Yeah, it's, it's a good word for you to focus on neglect. It's a harsh word, but it tells you the seriousness of becoming and staying involved because what you want is this new to be the status quo. And that's the evidence you want to see at trial to avoid making that mistake. All right, during uh, doing a sloppy job on financial records, and that is um, a very direct way to say, don't mess up your financial statements. 
uh, rule again, uh, I told you, let's uh, get a piece of pen or a piece of paper and a pen out, write down the tax return. Interestingly, on this slide, you'll see something really important, and that is a calculator. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, a, a great tool to use that most guys uh, tend to ignore. So uh, in our live seminars, uh, to emphasize why we call this the tax return, I ask guys to raise their hand about how many do their own taxes, and it is usually the super majority. I would say 70 to 80% of guys uh, either prepare their own taxes at, from beginning to end, or they do a substantial amount of work getting ready for their accountant to do their taxes. And so if you think about that tax time, we spend an inordinate amount of time preparing our taxes. We go through invoices and receipts. Uh, we go through bank statements, credit card statements. We look at every piece of paper that comes in the door. We fill out paperwork in advance of preparing our tax return. I mean, many guys spend hours in advance. You know, if they file anything but the 1040 easy, they're easily spending a couple hours just getting ready to file, gathering the uh, supporting documentation. I mean, even the 1040 easy, I think the, the least estimate on the IRS says 45 minutes, just going through it, getting to the website, calculating it. Even if you use TurboTax, there's enough questions in TurboTax that eats up 45 minutes. Then it double checks. Then it looks for potential deductions that you've missed. So I, I emphasize this because the reason we say doing a sloppy job on financial records, and we compare this to the tax return, it is that guys spend more time on their tax return than they do on their, the, probably the single most important document that they'll ever prepare, that they'll ever file in any family law related action, particularly divorce, and that is what's typically called the income and expense statement. And that is, what do you earn? What do you spend? And at the end of the day, what do you have left over? Because that is what the judges use to determine spousal support, child support, attorney's fees. They look at that as the gospel because whatever you put down there will come back to haunt you if it's done incorrectly. Yet, guys spend less time on the single most important document in family law than they do on their tax return. They'll spend 30 minutes, 20 minutes. We're sometimes the second lawyer in and we get the financial statements and they're done in pencil. And those were actually filed with the court in their own handwriting, which tells me no one reviewed them, no one double checked them, no one looked them looked at them for accuracy. And so you gotta ask yourself why, okay, why is it important? Why should I spend more time than my tax return? Why do we call it the tax return? And that is, think about it. If we spend two plus hours on our taxes, and we all do it for one reason, and that is we fear big brother. We fear the government. No one wants a phone call. No one wants a certified registered return receipt mail that says, Mr. Johnson, you're being audited for the last three years. Please set up an appointment because that strikes the fear of God in every human being when the IRS gets involved. <coughs> Yet, the chances of being audited are probably less than 4%. I ask how many people have been audited in a room. Typically, it's zero. Yet, they still spend more time on something that they perceive to be more important then what I can tell you absolutely is the most important document in your family law case. And so again, I'll use it as an example. I was trying a case in Georgia and opened up our Georgia office. Uh, at the end of a four day trial, I had filed, or, or my client filed first and I presented first. Uh, we were in day three and uh, I cross-examined the wife for two days on her financial statement. Uh, we had a semi-retired judge on the bench. I rested my case. Uh, judge immediately kicks his feet up, his boots up on the bench, picks up a newspaper and starts reading the newspaper. And all, you can't even see him. You can't see his head, just a giant newspaper. Opposing counsel is nervous, and he should be, because at that point I knew I had it won because the judge had made up his mind. Uh, and opposing counsel kind of uh, starts talking louder, still doesn't get anything from the judge, and says, Your Honor, I just want to make sure you can hear me. And Judge peered over that newspaper and said, Alan, I've already heard enough. And that is, she had spent such little time on her financial statement because the addition didn't add up. It was obvious she didn't use a calculator uh, because she uh, totaled up like $5,000 more than what they added up to. It was obvious her attorney didn't go through it. It's obvious her attorney didn't prepare her for it. And it's obvious that she was guessing at most of the expenses and she was asking for alimony or maintenance. And so as a result... Um, we won 
and the court didn't have any evidence within which to reach a conclusion to establish how much money she should get because he didn't have any uh, proof of evidence of, or proof or evidence of the expenses. And so on the flip side, if you list more income than expenses, at the end of the day, it says, oh, yes, I have $1,000 left over after I pay every single possible expense I can think of, which is a mistake guys make. What do you think the judge is going to do with that? It's not going to give it back to you and say you've worked so hard you can have it. He's going to give it to the other side. But most guys I talk to, most guys I see are living paycheck to paycheck, and they have more expenses than they have income. And so what I talk about sloppy, let's reflect what life is, and that is Guys live paycheck to paycheck and they have debt and they have credit card debt. So it's also not listing every expense because in most counties and most states, they have these pre-printed forms that are, most guys think are just everything that you should list. It's not. We add an appendix to the uh, items and expenses that perhaps aren't listed. Lawn care, subscriptions, internet, whatever it may be. Go through your bank statement, go through your credit card statement. Let's find out a life in the day and what do you spend? Dining, eating out, gas, gym membership. I mean, I can go on and on. Typically, they just live, list rent, mortgage, utilities, uh, food, clothing, entertainment. So you need to list everything you spend, and especially if you have kids. And then most importantly, here's a unique one. If you've moved out, these forms only list one set of expenses. They just go straight down. Well, you're paying double household expenses, right? So why don't you list two? So we add a column. We go down and add a column straight down next to it. So now you have double household expenses because that's life. That's real. And that's not fake money. It's not monopoly money. You're spending it. So let's list it. And so that's what we do. And then lastly, when you look for a lawyer, we talked about someone who will prepare you, someone who's prepared and organized, someone who'll spend the time with you. One of the things we do at Cordell and Cordell, and that is we spend an inordinate amount of time reviewing your financials. You'll prepare a draft. It'll go to a uh, paralegal who will then sit down with you to make sure that you've covered everything. Then you'll sit down with your attorney to make sure, one, that we think it has everything you need, but two, and most importantly, you know it. That you didn't guess. That you understand where everything came from. It's kind of the first step we're going to talk about in preparing you for testimonial hearings. And then finally, use a calculator. Uh, many guys are, are math geniuses, but double, triple, quadruple check your math because you get one chance at it. When you make a mistake, it'll be cross-examined and you'll look like a liar. Judges look at guys, they have one chance. One lie, you're a liar. Your wife, five, six, seven times. So it's important. Use a calculator, take your time. Now I'm not saying spend less time on your taxes, I'm saying spend more time on your financial statement. <clears throat> Talking too much especially to your wife. So a uh, little caution with this one, because it's taking it as gospel. Uh, it's something you should avoid, meaning that I don't want you to just stop talking to your wife. And that is, uh, I want you to talk, talk to her, try to reconcile, and especially if you have kids, you want to talk about the legal stuff. And that is major decisions regarding health, education, and welfare, right? You've got to do that. But again, uh, I've got a, a theme here. So write this one down. We've talked about the tax return. We've talked about doctor versus lawyer. This one is called Texas Hold'em. Everybody knows poker. Everybody probably has seen on TV at least once uh, the poker, you know, World Poker Championship or something, or guys playing poker at a table. So here's why I call this um, Texas Hold'em. And particularly, silence is golden. What matters most, don't share. And that is when you're, you're spending a lot of money with a lawyer and you're preparing your case and you're preparing to win, and you want to accomplish a lot of things, guys talk too much. They share too much information. Uh, they think they share it because they want to win an argument, right, with their spouse. So you're arguing about your, your case. You're arguing about your marriage. You're arguing about settlement. Do you really think you're going to win an argument because you haven't won one for the last 20 years of your marriage? You're not going to win this one. So as a lawyer, I used to do uh, employment discrimination defense for big corporations and jury trials. That compared to family law, you can share information with opposing counsel that'll help you get to a settlement in that kind of case, not in family law. I'm a big advocate of holding back, not sharing the evidence that you have, not showing your cards. Because imagine you're sitting at the poker table. 
the first two cards are down. You look, you pull them, you've got aces, right? No bets are in other than the big and the small blind. Who at that table, when you got two aces, would flop those cards over and say, I've got aces, who's in? No one, unless you want everyone to fold and to only get the small and the big blind. They hide it. They bluff. Not to denigrate or relegate your marriage into a poker game, but it is a business transaction. It is a game of bluffing because at times you don't want them to know what you will take and what you won't. You don't want them to know what your settlement parameters are. And particularly, you don't want them to know what your evidence is. That's equally important. So let me give you an example quickly. 25 years ago, I had a case, custody case. We hired an expert at the very end for custody. They did not, and we knew they had not. We were sitting very pretty in terms of custody. We had week on, week off, even though mom was going to ask at trial that client, dad, have only one night a week every other weekend. A very uh, odd request considering we had gone a year week on, week off. So we did an expert just to protect that. Expert was going to testify that she had observed dad, observed the kids interact, that based upon the kids' testimony, based upon their interactions and their desires, that anything less than what they were experiencing over the last 12 months would be damaging psychologically. So dad goes back to the house at one point, just a week or two before trial. They get into an argument about the settlement or trying to discuss settlement. They get an argument about the trial. She starts hammering in which every, I can tell you, every guy's going to experience this. Be prepared for it. You're a loser. You're going to lose. I'm going to take your money. I'm going to take your property. I'm going to take your retirement that you've worked hard for. I'm going to get it all. And when I get that all, I'm going to take you back to court in a couple of years and get more child support. And I'm going to get all my attorney's fees because your lawyer's a loser and you're going to pay and you're going to live in a one bedroom apartment with nothing while I live in your home that you built that you're paying for. And I'm going to have boyfriends and you're going to watch every bit of it. And I'm going to go on vacation while you get stuck in your little town. She did it. She kept going after him. So he said, well, yeah, wait till you hear from my expert. She stopped. She got what she wanted. She was trying to get information from him. And he showed his cards. Instead of keeping them close to the vest, instead of not talking, he talked too much. She calls her lawyer. They get an expert. Dueling experts cancel each other. We lose at trial. We were in the driver's seat. It was the evidence in which mattered most. It was her, his aces in the hole. He could have easily bluffed, just rode along, let everybody continue to ride and, and increase the bet, being very confident. But... He let her go. He let her do it. And he played her game. <clears throat> and he shared too much information. All that money we'd spent strategizing, all that money he had spent getting ready for his trial was now gone because he decided to talk too much. So yes, it is a game of poker. It is a game of positioning and bluffing and making the other side believe that you have something that maybe you don't or that you don't that you do. Going back to my original statement about uh, being prepared to file and to settle essentially means being prepared to try the case. He spent money preparing and it was blown by one moment. So what guys, the mistakes they need to do is walk away. You're not going to win. And I always say, let's look at it this way. When you got married, you were sitting next to each other at the table, looking out to all your friends and family. It was a great time. Now that you're getting divorced, she's not next to you on the same side of the table. She's across the table on the other side. It's a very different dynamic now. You're not together on the same side. You're on opposite sides of a transaction. And you need to understand that. And that's why you hire a lawyer to take care of it. That's mistake seven. <clears throat> All right, we're going to pick up speed so we can make it through. Uh, revealing too much on the Internet. So uh, this is a huge one, especially now in the onset of social media uh, I was on Dr. Phil and I talked a lot about um, social media and its effects on divorce and how to use it, uh, how not to use it. And the, they remain true then and they still remain true now. And that is, I can tell you with certainty, which is something rare in family law to have anything certain. And that is social media should not be used while you're going through divorce, while you're going through modifications. In any way, there's nothing positive from a social media presence only negative. And that is because we ask on our intake sheet, uh, are you on Facebook? Do you have an Instagram account? Do you have a Twitter account? And ask your spouses or girlfriends information because I want to look at it. In fact, I look at it before I come talk to you. I want to see what's on there. 
because nothing good can happen. You don't want to be on there, in fact, deactivate it. Don't delete it because you don't want to spoil evidence and get accused of destroying evidence. Just deactivate your account because you don't want your friends posting on your account as well. You may have gone out, had a great time. Somebody snapped a photo. You put it up on, uh, they tagged you, and now it's on your Facebook page. Uh, and I can take that photo and I can turn it as a negative to you. And that's what I did on Dr. Phil. He showed me some photos, and one was a mom uh, having a drink, and in the background was her child. Uh, and I, I don't know if it was water. I don't know if it was vodka. Her child was in the background. She had a couple friends over. So I turned it into she's having a booze party while her child's in the midst of it, an irresponsible mom over drinking, uh, overindulging. Uh, and that was probably, couldn't maybe it wasn't the truth, but maybe it was. I didn't know. And that's what you want to avoid. The point is you don't need to give the other side any ammunition. And lastly, stop making comments about your case. Again, Texas Hold'em, poker. Why share evidence about, hey, I can't wait till my best bud testifies for me at court next week. And then even, well, more importantly, don't make comments about the judge. We had a client who made a negative comment about the judge. Opposing counsel printed it out. Imagine the judge's reaction. Not too positive. Uh, whether it was into evidence or not, whether it were foundational issues, objections or not, it's already in. Judge knew about it. It becomes a huge, huge problem. I can tell you certainty. There is nothing positive about social media. Just deactivate it. No more photos, no more comments, no more likes. I don't care if you like a, a post from Twitter. Maybe you somehow, uh, someone hacks your account and you start liking something that's inappropriate. Whether you know you don't agree with it, uh, a fringe group, I'm telling you, uh, nothing positive. You're not going to use any evidence of it. You can use photos from something else, not your social media. So just deactivate your account. When it's all said and done, go back onto social media all you want. But uh, it is, you're revealing too much, spending too much to be risking everything on social media. <clears throat> all right, failing to fully engage in your case. And uh, this is a this is one where guys, I think, put too much emphasis, too much trust uh, in their attorney and assume that the attorney is going to do everything for them. But the relationship, whether it be a doctor or with a lawyer, is similar. It works two ways. It works. It's a two-way street. It isn't all give from one direction. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for it. And, I, and when I mean be engaged, it really is be involved. And be involved in your case. Be involved in what's going on. Uh, do homework, do research on your cases, on, on the, the statutes, uh, on the relevant cases that have come out. Gather discovery. Well, I always tell clients, look, go home, start gathering everything. And, and at the end, what you're doing is you're saving attorney's fees. Huge. If you can write a book about how to save attorney's fees, this would be one step on how to do it. And that is be proactive in your case. That doesn't mean you're being a lawyer. It just means you're being proactive. I've had clients come in with binders, organized. Uh, we had a contempt case where client was being accused of not paying his fair share of, of substantial extracurricular activities. And we're talking $50,000 over the course of 10 years. A very active children in a lot of sports and a lot of extracurricular activities. So he came in with three binders. Every single receipt was tabbed, marked, what it was for, with an email behind it saying that they had, had agreed to it or had not agreed to it. Um, I didn't have to do any of that. I probably would have spent five to seven thousand dollars in fees preparing those exhibits had he not done that yes it was his time but he saved an enormous amount of money not only that he knew every expense inside and out by being actively engaged by being involved by doing his own math or research and investigation his homework his testimony became that much more credible and when i asked him about an exhibit or an expense he goes yes it's on exhibit 32a and that was for gymnastics. And that was when we both had an agreement. And there's an email backing it up that I sent. She responded to, and I paid. And here's my canceled check. Testimony was fantastic. Uh, we can gather tax returns, gather bank statements. Uh, I even tell clients to call their plan administrator at their company to get their pension information. So that when it comes time to dividing their 401k or their pension, we get a sample, what's called Quadro, QDRO, Qualified Domestic Relations Order. I'm going to spend 150 bucks just making a phone call trying to get a sample so that I can divide their quadro. This is money saved. It's easy phone calls. So we talk about being engaged, but work with your attorney. Work with your counsel to prepare your case. And that helps you knowing your facts. When we talk about sloppy financials, 
You want to know the facts. So when you're actively and fully engaged, you're more informed, you're more credible, and ultimately your case is going to be, pre be presented in a much better fashion. Because when representing guys, I've said it before, it's about appearance and preparation. All right, lastly, we're going to talk about being ill-prepared for testimony and interviews. <clears throat> so really, the title should be Prepare, Prepare, and Prepare, uh, because that really sums it up. Uh, I was watching the uh, American League Division Series or, uh, last night or the day before. Interesting, every major league team goes through a, a pregame warm-up. Every major league team, every NBA team, every NHL team, they do something. In the major leagues, they do they hit the batting cage. These guys are at the top of their game. They're the best of the best, right? They probably don't need it, but they prepare. They, they see 10 pitches. They want to get sharp, uh, and they still do it. It's like um, pilots on an airplane. They know how to fly it. They've been doing it for 30 years, but they go through that checklist. They prepare. So when you're facing the most important day, import, most important moment of your life that has involved everything you've worked for, your property, your retirement, and then importantly, your kids, prepare. Um, meet with your attorney. And that's why I said when you're picking out an attorney, talk to someone who has a way and a process of preparation. Uh, one of the things we do at Cordell is we have litigation roadmaps. And we outline, here's where we are, here's where you want to be, and how are we going to get there? And what preparation is needed along the way? You know, before any uh, significant testimonial event, you've got to come into our office 48 to 72 hours in advance. If it's a trial, it's a week. Prepare. Know your case. Too many people I've seen just walk in the door and they tell their client, oh, we'll get ready before the trial. That's a huge mistake. You're spending too much and too much is on the line. You might as well sit down, feel comfortable with what's going on, feel comfortable with the strategy, and feel comfortable knowing that you can testify to it. Because, again, guys can't make a mistake. May maybe one, and I can try to uh, reconcile that mistake as something that was just a simple one. But when you're not prepared and you start fumbling through the evidence, through your testimony, you start fumbling through what we had planned, and that is preparing for direct and cross-examination, it's disastrous. And so some of the things we want to do is, we actually, if you're going to testify, let's go through a dry run. Here are the questions, some of the questions I'm going to ask you. Here are some of the topics we're going to go through and actually ask you the questions and see what your answers are. We want to talk about how you want to answer it. Where do you want to look? How do you want to look? What are you going to wear? Uh, it matters. I had a guy walk in one time. I told him, wear a suit. He came in in clothes that looked like he was mowing his lawn. He thought he knew better. He thought the judge would think too much of him if he wore a suit. Well, the opposite happened. The point is, it's preparation. No one in understanding. And then more importantly, and probably the most important preparation you'll do, is preparing for cross-examination. Knowing and preparing for the unexpected. Because oftentimes, I can try to tell you what I think they're going to do, the questions that they're going to ask, the facts and the evidence that they're going to cross-examine you with and try to catch you, try to make you embarrass you, or look like you're lying. I'm going to ask you those. I'm going to ask you tough questions. But your lawyer needs to do that, and you need to be prepared to do it. It takes hours. You'll be in and preparing for a full day, just getting ready. But if you watch some of the Supreme Court nomination hearings in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, you know that they prepared. You know that those were questions that were probably already asked. The answers were canned, and they were ready. And it was an effective. It was good. Uh, but the point is, is no one goes in unprepared, especially when all is on the line. And that is, if you're ill-prepared for even the simplest of motions, the simplest of temporary hearings, it, don't expect a good result. Because if you or neither you or your attorney are willing to invest that time, then the, the result is going to be a wasted amount of money. So... Lastly, know your financial statements. We talked about that. Prepare. Go through how you came up with every uh, number, how you came up with every expense, how you ended the result of what you have and what you don't have, the values of your property, marital and separate. Uh, it's A lot goes into it, especially if you have a multi-day trial. So you may have preparation after begin the beginning of the first day. You may have preparation after the first day. Demand it. Do not wait for it for your attorney to ask about it. So 
being ill-prepared is a huge mistake. All right, 60 minutes in a whirlwind. So wanted to let you know that if you want more information about the 10 stupidest mistakes, but more importantly, the process along the way, we have something coming up. It's the Cordell and Cordell Men's Divorce School. Again, it's free, but it's live and in person on Tuesday, October the 23rd at 6 p.m. at the Chattanooga Marriott Downtown Hotel. And we say go to mensdivorceschool.com to get more information or register. And if you're a guy facing divorce, and we always say one that you probably don't want, or maybe you don't want one at all, you want to go to one of these seminars because you want to talk to a lawyer live. Have a chance to ask some questions, hopefully get some answers. So thanks for joining. Hope you got a lot of information and hope she helps you along the way.